Yeah. Yeah. So I've been at uh, Duke for um, about 25 years and uh, during my fellowship training years um, we witnessed actually the death of a little baby with infantile Pompe disease. We um, went to the funeral of this little one because we were unable to save um, her life and that was a decision that was made by my mentor Dr. Chen when he came back from the funeral and he said that this would not repeat itself. That's where the journey for development of a treatment for Pompe disease began. Um, it was a 15-year odyssey from bench to bedside and um, I was there right from the very beginning, um, right from watching the quail birds that were affected with Pompe disease um, after they received the recombinant uh, enzyme and were able to fly to sitting in uh, Dr. Chen's office and coming up with the endpoints uh, for a clinical trial for three babies with infantile Pompe disease. Uh, we had picked the infants for reasons that are very clear. The disease is lethal. Babies die within the first year of life. Um, so from a compassionate access uh, perspective or from a humanitarian perspective, we felt we owed it to these uh, families and these uh, babies. Why we only started with three was, as you know, how drug development goes. There was not enough uh, enzyme that was being developed at the time uh, in terms of manufacturing and we wanted to have sufficient supply for at least two years when we embarked on this uh, phase one, phase two clinical trial. After the success of the first three babies, uh, when I say success, actually one did extremely well and two after doing well initially uh, started to decline clinically. And I'll come back to that full circle to say how every patient in a rare disease cohort teaches us so much. Um, that's when the partnership with Genzyme began, um, when the licensing from Duke was taken over. Um, by Genzyme and we entered into phase two and then subsequently phase three clinical trials. Um, in the phase three trials we treated 18 babies and this was globally. I was the lead principal investigator and uh, it was very momentous when we went to the FDA and uh, had these videos of children who after 52 weeks of treatment with enzyme replacement therapy were now walking, running, meeting motor milestones that they never would have accomplished uh, given the natural history of this disease is death within the first year of life and when I say death you have these bright-eyed little children but who are so weak that they were called um, ragdoll baby, floppy baby, words such as these um, to describe them in the literature. So this was actually a very historic moment um, because this is I believe, of course, the first neuromuscular disease for which a treatment was approved. But I think even more important is that it was the infants that paved the way for broad label approval. We normally have a trickle down effect of adult studies and then we scale it down uh, to the pediatric population. So it was fairly remarkable and um, I played um, a role throughout this drug development process. Um, but then the next part of the story was why is it that some babies did not do well? If you recollect, I told you two out of the three in the initial study didn't do well. And that's because uh, they absolutely made no enzyme. You know, it's what we call cross-reactive immunological material negative. So when we first uh, started uh, these discussions, um, people really thought I was crazy, you know, and what was I talking about? Um, because I used to talk about an immune response or an antibody response to the recombinant enzyme. And uh, today I think it's very well recognized in the field of rare diseases, or for that matter, any space where you are treating someone with a therapeutic protein, that if you make an immune response or an IgG antibody response, which is what we call high and sustained, uh, no matter what you do, um, that patient is not going to do well. So I think Pompey led the way and I take a lot of pride in saying that work spearheaded by Duke um, really led to this broader understanding of the role of immunogenicity uh, to a therapeutic protein which goes beyond 
enzyme replacement therapy. I think it even goes along for gene therapy. So as we continued on the process and developed now a protocol, which is today a standard of care, and in fact is uh, used um, not just in the United States, it's used globally as a standard of care for what we call the CRIM negative infants with Pompe disease. It's now finding its way for other rare diseases, including uh, MPS type 1, MPS type 2, a consideration for other rare diseases such as hemophilia, um, hypophosphatasia. This question is being brought up by the FDA repeatedly. What is the immune response so that it can be dealt with appropriately? So as we were continuing in our um, successes, we also started recognizing that uh, many of these infants, uh, despite what we felt were being diagnosed early, were not doing well uh, after a certain period of time. And that's where um, I started to recognize that when I say I, it's not just singularly as an I, it's we as a rare disease community started to recognize that um, the earlier you initiate treatment in a very rapidly progressive condition. So if you think of someone who's going to die within the first year of life, if you capture them or diagnose them by six months, we, put, we give ourselves a pat on our back and say, we've done a great job. But when I rethink this, um, it's too late because there's so much irreversible damage that has occurred. So that's what um, got me thinking into the role of newborn screening for Pompe disease. And so I nominated Pompe disease, I believe in 2008, for consideration to be on the recommended uniform screening panel. So um, it was rightfully rejected um, a few times because there were unanswered questions. But I think each time the Secretary's Advisory Committee uh, for Heritable Disorders you know, asked the questions, it allowed more research in our systematic way to allow those questions to be answered. And um, in 2015, um, Pompeii was added to the RASP for the recommended uniform screening panel. And there are many states now here in the US where uh, Pompeii disease is now added to the RASP. And I think we are seeing a new natural history emerge uh, because of earlier diagnosis and earlier treatment for many of these infants but also, I would say, a better understanding of the um, infants who would have presented with so-called later onset presentation of Pompe disease uh, now at birth. So I think it's raised a lot more awareness even for me as a treating physician of what I have missed through the years for these later onset presentations. Many of them truly do have presentation quite early in life by the first year of life. And so I think it's an exciting time for the field where we will start to understand what the impact of earlier treatment is. And so Pompeii was the first of the lysosomal storage disorders to be added to the RASP. And now it's followed by MPS1. And now we know that adrenoleukodystrophy is there. And I think the list will continue to grow um, because there are many physicians uh, who are championing the rare disease that they've spent an entire career on to try and get it added to the RASP, not just to add a disease, but because it truly makes a difference. So having said that, I thought I was going to retire and would never have Pompeii on the RASP. Um, and so now I still have many years ahead of me. Um, and I feel that my focus today is on other rare diseases. I feel Duke has been instrumental in bringing hypophosphatasia uh, to full drug approval. Um, Duke was part of it from the phase one work uh, where the first uh, three adults were done at Duke. At that time it was part of a startup company called Inobia and then it was uh, um, bought out by Alexion and so we've partnered with them and come full circle um, of course with many other investigators to prove um, having an approved therapy for it um, and today I chair the registry for hypophosphatasia so I feel that the lessons I've learned from many of the other rare diseases, such as Gaucher and Pompeii, Fabry, mucopolysaccharidosis, I can bring it back now to uh, yet another rare disease, such as hypophosphatasia. So it was outside my comfort zone when I started. I'm not an endocrinologist or a bone specialist. 
But I think when you listen to the patients and you listen hard and carefully, I truly have believed this, that you can um, champion uh, any rare disease if you're passionate and decide to use the lessons that you've learned from the other rare diseases towards the next new disease. So now that I've completed a first journey with hypophosphatasia, my uh, desire is to try and bring hypophosphatasia to newborn screening, you know, to bringing it as a condition for newborn screening, and then spend uh, the remaining years of my career to developing uh, treatments for other glycogen storage diseases. Um, I've been very fortunate to have been trained by what I feel is the world's best mentor I could have had in terms of Dr. Chen, um, but also by Dr. Rob Califf, uh, you know, who has been at Duke for many years and really has guided me, encouraged me um, to always think big, think outside the box and think of new treatments. Um, so today I think at Duke we're doing a lot of work in the space of the glycogen storage diseases and I do hope that um, before I finish out my career, um, I'll be able to have some hope for these conditions as well.